Hi, and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas, and we both work at the uh, University of Kentucky in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and we have another cram-packed show, and uh, we can't wait to get started. I know, Renee, it's going to be a good day. We've got um, a, a variety of guests, and we're going to be talking about a variety of different topics. Um, we're going to start off with uh, Mr. Bobby Ammerman. Um, Bobby is um, at our Wood Utilization Center. He's also the Assistant Director of the Robinson Center for Appalachian Resource Sustainability down in Jackson, Kentucky. So we'll hear from Bobby here in a minute. But we also have Laurie Thomas going to be doing our ever-popular Tree of the Week. And I'll, I'll save that until I let Laurie introduce that for you here in a minute. Um, and then following that, we've got something that's really been getting a a lot of attention here recently in the news. Yeah. It's going to be a big deal, the periodic cicada. So we got a, a UK entomologist, Dr. Jonathan Larson, is going to be joining us, um, and he might get an assist from Dr. Ellen Crocker. So it should be a great show. Um, as a reminder, you can interact with us via the chat pod if you're joining us via Zoom, and if you're on Facebook Live, please use the comment section. Exactly. So let's get started. So uh, Bobby, would you mind joining us? There you are. Good morning, hey, Bobby. Bobby. How are you? Good. How are you guys? Good. Good. Thanks for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about what your video is going to be on? Yeah, it's just basically an overview of the of the University of Kentucky Wood Utilization Center. Um, it's actually part of our cars down in Jackson, Kentucky. And we do various programs from research to general education to doing some classroom work. So um, the video is just going to kind of describe all that, all those activities. and. Um, you know, that's about it. So uh, it'll be, you know, it'll be pretty informative. We, you know, we cover a lot of things pretty quick. So, you know, if you're really interested, you gotta, you gotta pay attention to catch what's going on. So um, with that, I'll, I'll let you guys play the video. Well, one, one just second though. It was originally videoed at the state fair. Is that right? It was originally uh, done for the state fair, but um, you know, because there was, you know, it's just so, so much information uh, crammed in there uh, in a short period of time. It's kind of hard to replicate that. So mm -hmm. um, rather than redoing the video or whatever, we, we just kind of run it the way it is with yeah. it. Yeah, I don't blame it. you at all. I just wanted to make sure people understood why it said State Fair on it. <laughs> this facility was built back in the early 1960s, about 62, 63. But the idea was, was to create more processing of the timber that was leaving the area. If you look at some of these wonderful pictures that we've got hanging on the wall here, um, you can see in the background here, this one picture, and this is actually right here at the station, what you're looking at. You can see the trees are pretty much gone from the picture. Um, you know, even here, there's a few trees left, but there's been a lot of, a lot of clearing. And so what happened was, was, was that this whole area in eastern Kentucky, for the most part, was clear-cutted in the early 19th century, you know, right around at the uh, you know 1900s, early 1900s. And so what happened was, was if you think about it, a tree takes about 50 to, to 80 years to reach maturity. So um, if you think about 1900 to 1962, well, you can kind of put the timeline together and realize, well, there was just a lot of timber growing here now that was, um, you know, highly priced timber. And, um, and so it was being cut and, and put on rail carts and hauled out of the area and with no processing done to it. And so that's why the, the, uh, this grant was put together to, to, to build this facility. And so the idea was, was you know, we, we build a, a workforce, a skilled set, and then from that will lead to um, more value added or processing to the timber before it leaves the area. So there's a lot of history here and a lot of how things developed and happened over time that relates back to here within the college. So we've tried to take the facility and use it uh, for a couple of different functions. Um, one, for industry support, and two, for um, trying to educate the general public about forestry issues, right? And, uh, and so what you're looking at right here is one of the programs that we do. We do these little workshops where a um, group of folks will come in the center and we will let them or help them make one of these items that you see right here, one of these wood items. So we do some industry training as well. Um, as a matter of fact, you can see this, this chart here on the wall. That's actually a grading chart. So one of the things that gets done here uh, periodically is a lumber grading short course. Um, 
as well as an edging, edging and trimming short course. That's happened here as well in, in the last little bit. And then we get back in the facility and we'll show you some of, some of the other things that we do related to, to some of the machine work. Now, this table right here, it's up here because um, the four years, the four year forestry students that are based in Lexington, they actually spend roughly a week here. And, and each one of them makes, gets, to, gets to make a table, one of these tables right here, and take it home with them. And so what we do is, is we set up and run this in a production run, and then we chart all of the costs that's associated with the production of the table. Um, and we run this in a production environment. And then when they're done, they have to do a report on why, why, why did it cost what it did to produce this table, you know? And what value added did we make to the table? Did we, did we actually add any value or did we go in, the, we go in reverse? And so um, this has really been a good tool to get the, the students to study forestry to understand why it's so important to grow nice, straight, clear trees in the woods. Yeah, so we, you know, I mentioned that we were trying to do extension activities, which is a primary thing here, but also we're trying to mix in a little bit of research. So this pad, what you see right here, is a research project for uh, a student within the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources to monitor um, drying uh, white oak staves for the bourbon industry. And so we hope to get a bunch of staves sitting out here and they're tracking the process of uh, our progress of how those staves are losing moisture, uh, maybe even how they're getting some back, you know, in certain conditions. And so that's what this pad's for. And, and hopefully it'll be a bit, uh, pretty, pretty nice item to add to our research here at the center. What you're looking at right here, or what we call tree cookies, and, um, and they're white oak, and they're gonna eventually be on display at the uh, Fraser Museum in Louisville. So when, when the Bourbon Trail, when, when you first get introduced to it or when it starts, it's meant to start at the Fraser Museum in Louisville. And so we're gonna, this is all part of, of adding to their display there um, on, on barrel production basically. Um, and of course you need the barrel for the, for the bourbon production. And then these here are barrel heads. So this is a, a pretty neat project right here that we did. And basically these represent the first certified for sustainability grown white oak that went into a bourbon barrel. So all these tops were made from that certified material. This right here is a collection of, of lumber that we have that we use for the different programs. But I will point out that there's, there's two cubby holes of chestnut up here. And uh, we do have cameras on those <laughs> because those things uh, could disappear if we're not keeping an eye on them. There's just not that much chestnut left um, particularly in those kind of quantities. So all the equipment that you see in here, that's this dull gray, that was all original to 1962 when the facility was, uh, was put in production. Anything that's different, like this CNC router over here is a different color, that's been added since then. So the router's been added, and then I'll show you, there's a couple pieces up here that's been added as well. So one of the programs that, that I haven't talked about is Win With Wood. So Win With Wood is a program that's designed for high school students and middle school students. And basically, uh, and it's a 4-H program. And basically they come to the center, their teachers bring them, their club directors bring them. Um, and they come to the center here and we have, we have this whole, whole area here full of tables with different things on them that they're identifying and, 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 and actually having a contest to see um, how much of it that, they, that they've learned and, and, and know. So some of the events are, are compass and pacing, um, woodworking tool ID, forestry tool ID. Um, we, uh, we have a wood ID uh, contest component to it. Um, and invasive species, that's another one, another component to it. So they come and they compete in all these different events and then the winner will get, the senior winner will get a scholarship to attend the University of Kentucky uh, College of Ag. It's a $500 scholarship. It's not a whole lot of money, but it's a little bit for those that really want to participate in, in further education. We're doing that not because um, we're really trying to, not because we're trying to teach the kids so much, but we really want to get to the teachers. And, 
if we get the teachers teaching the kids, then we impact a lot more people, a lot more students than if we're just trying to impact the individual student themselves. So one of the other programs that we, that we do here is an entrepreneurship program. We've been doing these, uh, do, we've had this program in place for about 10 years or so. And so our idea there is, is the facility's not used to its max. So we have, we have lag time here that somebody that has an interest in doing wood, wood products, either as a very serious hobby or trying to make a living from it, we like to support them uh, by allowing them to use some of the equipment here in the center. And like I said, we've, you know, over the last 10 years or so, we've worked with probably a dozen or so in different capacities. John Markham here is one of them that we've worked with. He's been here almost since the beginning. The idea is that we get them, we get people in here, we train them or help train them or let them use a piece of equipment maybe they don't have to make a particular product. So lastly, I'll talk about this machine right here. This is a molder and um, any baseboard or casing or crown mold or any of that kind of thing that's in your house has basically went through a machine like this. And um, so here in Kentucky, our industry uses this. It's a very high production machine and it, uh, it's almost required if, you're, if, they're, if someone's doing anything or a plant's doing anything in any kind of quantity. So over the years, we've used this machine to train a lot of industry people. And uh, a lot of times somebody will get, you know, they'll be working, helping an operator on the machine and maybe that operator leaves or whatever, and then the person that's helping becomes the machine operator, and he never has any, any um, training. He just kind of throwed on it and said, here, kind of figure it out in a lot, of, a lot of regards. And so we're trying to gap that bridge a little bit, uh, helping uh, those plants that you know, need some formal training. And of course, we don't have all the answers to everything, but you know, we'll certainly try to help teach what we know, and so we've done that over the years. Quite, quite effectively, I think. And we do all this because we're supporting a $13 billion industry here in the state of Kentucky. Again, I think that, that goes unknown. A lot of people here doesn't, don't realize that the wood industry is that large here in the state. And the, the key component to it is just not in one area. It's not like a automotive plant that's sitting in Georgetown. It, it's, our industry is spread out all across the, the state. So it impacts a lot of rural area. Um, and uh, very important to our state economy. Thank you, Bobby, for that video. We greatly appreciate that. And, um, you know, our, um, it is a big industry. And uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, you know, kind of said it in the video, I mean, $13 billion, you know, what more do you need to say? You know, right, exactly. I, think it, I think it ranks, Billy, you can help me out with this. Is there anything ranks higher? I, I think it kind of depends on what statistics you look at, that kind of thing, and who's making the argument. But um, I believe we can say it's probably the largest industry in the state, or at least in the top few anyway. It's so, up there. It is up there for sure. Um, you know, and again, you know, I said in the video, the fact that it impacts the rural areas of the state is, um, you know, I mean, here, I, you know, give you an example. I live in a county in Eastern Kentucky that the largest employer is the school, right? And, and, um, and if it wasn't for what, what logging activity and sawmill activity happens here in this county, um, man, I'm, I'm not sure what industry would still exist here. So, you know, I know we have a little bit of oil and gas and that kind of thing, but um, still the, you know, without the timber, um, you know, man, I don't know what will be left. So you know, at this point, we see a lot more logging trucks on the road, right, uh, in this area than we do coal trucks by far, you know, and that used to not be the case. So right. um, logging really impacts all the rural areas, or not logging, but the timber industry really impacts all the counties across the state and all the rural areas too. So. Well, and if anybody's interested in that, they can join us on March 31st because we're going to have a, have you back on again to talk about that. Yeah, well, I mean, I just said it all, so maybe you don't have to come back. Oh, <laughs> now, Bobby, come on. <laughs> but there you know, is a lot to it, for sure. One thing I'm curious <laughs> about is, um, you know, you, you mentioned a lot of workshops and programs that you do, and how do people come and participate in that? Well, it's um, occasionally we'll we'll have these workshops, like, you know, when we're talking about workshops, we're talking about coming to the Wood Center, making cutting board, or, you know, making a Lazy Susan, or a cookbook holder, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, um, you know, basically we're not really doing it to, to uh, you know, give you a wood item to take home or help you make a wood item to take home. We're really doing it because you're going to have to spend, you know, probably 40 minutes with us sitting down in a chair at a table and listening to some kind of rhetoric that we want to tell you about, right? So, <laughs> Um, we really education, use that right? Yes. Education. Yeah, it's all it, it, it's yeah. intended to be education, and and um, you know we just want you to sit down and listen to something. You know, listen to us about something that's going on. Usually in the woods, uh, a lot of times it relates to forest health, um, but but something that's going on that could affect you, uh, especially if you have any any property that's got timber on it, and that kind of thing. So um, again, we kind of use it as a carrot. But if you want to participate, um, the best way to participate is is uh, to get a hold of your county agent and uh, say, hey, we, you know, we like to we like to go to Jackson and and, and participate in making one of these products, and um, you know, and most of the time they just get coordinated through the, the county extension office, and mm -hmm. um, and if you're an agent and you're interested in trying to put together a small group to come, um, just give me a call or email me, and and man, I'd be glad to set that up, you know. We've kind of been on hold since this COVID stuff in terms of having people in the center, um, but that those restrictions are starting to loosen a little bit. So I think, I think by May or June we'll we'll be back up to um, to capacity as terms of, of letting people in and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, yeah, we're we're getting geared up to start that process again. That's wonderful. Yeah. Bobby, I was going to say, I've had a chance to be part of many of those programs down there, and they are really impressive. Um, you know, the Win With Wood is one of my funnest ones. I'm um, getting to enjoy all those kids and those teachers. But, you know what, we're really kind of empowering those teachers to, to get that education out. And like you said, it's really a multiplier effect. If we can get those teachers educated on these subjects, and we can really touch a lot more kids in that regard. So, um, yeah, and I'll tell you, you all are doing good work, man. You all are doing yeah, good just work. Just to add to that comment, one of the things that we've done with Win With Wood, and and uh, Renee's been a big help in that is we built a website of, um, of how to train yourself or students on all these, you know, on these eight events that we have competitions in at Win With Wood. So um, I, I know it's a pretty good resource for teachers um, and some agents. And um, it's, it's, there's just a lot of good information there. It's, it's not all necessarily on the site. Some of it links you somewhere else or whatever. But it's just really, it's really a good resource uh, in terms of learning a little bit about, you know, how our, well, just timber in general, how it works and, and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I'd encourage anybody, if you haven't been to that website, go to it. It's Win with, win with Wood. We Google that and it'll it'll pop right up. And Renee's dropped it in the chat box for us there. So if you all. I'm right Thank you, Renee. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's a outstanding work down there. And Bobby, thank you so much for being with us this morning and, um, you know, sharing a little bit about the Wood Utilization Center. Oh, thank you guys. Yeah. All right. Well, moving on to our tree of the yeah. week. Lori yeah. Thomas, can, there you are. Hey, how's hey, everyone? How are you? Good. How's everyone doing today? It's nice. Yeah. Nice outside still, at least it's warm, so. Right, exactly. <laughs> I feel like spring is coming, so. I know, <laughs> we're almost there, right? <laughs> real close, real close. Oh, yeah. All right, so what are we talking about this week, Laurie? All right, so our tree of the week is um, sweet gum, and I chose that tree because it does still have winter appeal. Um, you know, we don't have leaf out yet, but it tends to hold, retain a lot of its um, fruiting bodies because uh, the seeds will come out of the little, you know, the sweet gum balls. If any of you all as kids used to play with those, throw them at one another or whatnot. But a lot of times it'll keep those on the tree throughout the winter. So you got a little bit of winter appeal. And uh, uh, many times you'll have individuals that have out on the branching that'll be kind of corky um, and look kind of winged. So there's, you know, some kind of appeal without the leaves on, but it's, a, it is a great um, fall tree as well. The fall color is spectacular. So here's sweet gum. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the sweet gum. Sweet gum, liquid ambar styrus affluia, is an important commercial hardwood tree of the southeastern United States. It's also known as red gum, sap gum, and star leaf gum. It is a relative of witch hazel and the only species of liquid ambar in North America. The three other species are native to Asia. Sweet gum is a large deciduous tree that can grow over 100 feet tall and 3 to 5 feet in diameter. It is a relatively fast growing tree that can live about 200 to 300 years. It is classified as shade intolerant and when young the tree has a pyramid shaped crown but as the tree matures the crown becomes more oval and rounded. 
Sweet gum's native range includes the southeastern United States up into southern Illinois and west into Oklahoma, with scattered locations in central Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. It is a bottomland species, but is found in a variety of soils. It grows best in moist alluvium soils. It tolerates flooding and is somewhat sensitive to drought. While a bottomland species, it can often be a pioneer species in old fields and logged areas. Sweet gum makes an excellent urban tree, provided it has a large enough area for root development and there are numerous selected cultivars used in landscaping. The leaves of this tree are its best identifying characteristic. They are alternately arranged on the twig, simple and star-shaped, with five to seven lobes. The lobes are typically pointed, but occasionally can be rounded. The leaves are usually about four to six inches across, and the margins are finely serrated. They are shiny green above, paler underneath with pubescence in the axils of the veins. They are fragrant when crushed, and autumn color is typically outstanding. On a single tree, leaves may be yellow, red, or purple. Sweet gum is monoecious, meaning one house, which means a tree has both male and female flowers. The female flowers are on slender hanging stalks and capped with rounded heads. The male flowers are in upright clusters and often tinged with red. The flowers bloom in early spring between March and early May, and the flowers are wind pollinated. The fruit is a spiny, woody, spherical cluster of capsules that's one to one and a half inches in diameter. The fruit is a lustrous green, maturing to brown in September to November. The capsules have a beak-like look and open when ripe to release small winged seeds, usually one or two per capsule. The winged seeds are dispersed by wind and the empty fruiting globes remain on the tree over winter. Trees begin seed production between 20 and 30 years up until about 150 years of age. Seed production is variable and depends greatly on climactic conditions during the growing season. Good seed crops occur about every three years. The bark is gray-brown with irregular furrows and rough rounded ridges, and the twigs often have corky outgrowths, as you can see in the photo. The handsome wood has wide sapwood that is whitish to light pink or tan, often called sap gum, and the heartwood is gray to reddish brown and is referred to as red gum. The heartwood that has darker black streaks is called figured red gum and the wood has a good luster, and the wood is sometimes called satin walnut. The heartwood is rated moderately durable to decay, but the sapwood is rated as perishable. Sweet gum is a moderately important tree for wildlife. A variety of birds and mammals consume the seeds, including towhees, purple and gold finches, chickadees, and chipmunks and squirrels. Beaver also utilize the wood to construct their dams. And since it's a common bottomland species, it provides nesting sites for wetland and bottomland birds. The wood is used for veneer, lumber, plywood, furniture, including speaker and acoustic cabinets, crates, and railroad ties. The National Champion Sweet Gum, as of 2021, is in Burlington, New Jersey. It is 228 inches in circumference, 132 feet tall, with a 112-foot crown spread. The Kentucky Champion Sweet Gum, as of 2021, is in Fulton County at the Fish and Wildlife Obanion Creek Wildlife Management Area. It's 152 inches in circumference, 140 feet tall, with a 75-foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest National Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about sweet gum. Sweet gum's name comes from the clumps of sap that ooze from the bark if the tree is wounded. Medicinally, sweet gum is known as cope balsam, which is a resinous gum that was used for the treatment of a variety of ailments throughout Mexico and Europe. Pioneers used sweet gum resin for healing wounds, chewing, incense, and to make perfume. The resins were used during World War I and World War II in manufacturing drugs, soaps, and adhesives. The scientific genus name liquid ambar is from the Latin liquidus and ambar, meaning liquid amber, referring to the resin. And the species name styrosiflua is Latin for styrax flowing, referring to the resinous sap that comes from the bark. I'm glad you joined me to learn about the sweet gum and get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy the sweet gum.
Thank you, Lori. We greatly appreciate you um, doing that for us. And, you know, um, I was wondering, did, did you say that the sap was chewed? Yes, I did. I didn't know that either. Um, Explain that. <laughs> so, so the, um, there's a lot, most of our trees have a lot of ethnobotanical uses. So they've been used for a long time. I mean, if you want to know more about some of those, you can go to the USDA plants database, look up your tree, and there's going to be, not every tree will, there, but there'll be fact sheets on them, but they'll include a lot of those different um, former uses of the tree. But um, what they would do is they would knock off or damage the tree, uh, the bark, so that it saps, that sap will ooze out, and you let it harden, let that sap harden for about a week, and then you can pull it off and supposedly chew it. So um, and this, I know, yeah, the, the sap, <laughs> The sap had a lot of medicinal uses too. They used it to make salves and ointments and things like that. Um, back before we had all our synthetic drugs and stuff now. So, but yeah, it's a pretty, oh, okay. <laughs> a pretty interesting tree for sure. Yeah. Do we have a lot of them in Kentucky? Um, it, we find it according to USDA plants database. Um, it's found in all but 15 counties. Um, and when you look at the U.S. Forest Service forest inventory analysis data, I think the most recent I've looked at is probably 18 or 19. Um, it was like 18th in number of stems in the state. So mm -hmm. it's quite a few. I mean, you know, red maple's the most numerous in stems, but um, mm -hmm. uh, sweet gum's pretty good up there at 18, and that's total number of stems. So, yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you for joining us again. Yeah. Great. Love the segments, really. Yeah. All great. right. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, so now, you know, if anything's know. bugging you, we might need to talk to uh, Jonathan Larson. <laughs> Fortunately, we have an excellent entomologist and Dr. Jonathan Larson. Um, Jonathan, how are you today? Doing well, doing well. How are you? Thank you for having me on. Uh, how's Thanks everybody doing? Joining us. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you're going to talk about today. Well, I'm here to talk about periodical cicadas, these 17-year cicadas that I know lots of folks have been hearing about. I know a lot of the agents have already been getting questions about them, mm -hmm. and I think it's a really exciting phenomenon. It's something that is uh, very interesting to me as an entomologist, but I know that for other people hearing that billions of bugs are going to come out of the ground in our state, it's not necessarily welcome <laughs> news. Yeah, that's supposed to be in 2020, not 2020. <laughs> oh, no. oh, no, it was murder cicadas or murder hornets oh, last year, this year. Yeah, now right. it's, it's a little different. So tell us a little bit about these cicadas. Well, so these are periodical cicadas, and cicadas are a very interesting group of insects in of themselves. They're part of the hemiptera, the true bugs. So they're related to things like scale insects and aphids and a few others. And they all have this needle-like mouth part that they use to feed on fluids for food. The cicadas are unique in that they have a nymphal stage, their baby stage, which lives below ground before emerging and crawling up a plant nearby so they can pull themselves out of their nymphal shell and emerge as an adult. That's something that we all are pretty familiar with every year. We find those shells. If you're weird like me, you may hang them in your beard or try and see how many you can get on your shirt or something like that. <laughs> but um, those shells are something that I think are familiar to a lot of people. So we see the cicadas every year. Those are annual cicadas. We do have quite a few native annual cicadas in the state. They're usually green and black in color, and they do come out every year, uh, usually a little later in the summer, that sort of like August, July time frame. These ones are a little different since they're periodical cicadas. They only come out every 13 or 17 years, depending on the species. They are black, they have red eyes, and they have orange fringe on their wings, sort of. Uh, so they do look quite a bit different. I do have some specimens here in a box I can show off. We can see this is the periodical up top. So it's a little smaller than the annual cicada that we see down here, different in color. And they emerge in May and June. So they come out a little earlier in the year as well. So it's just a, a slightly different version of what we see every year, but it is special because they've spent 17 years under the ground in tr by tree roots, feeding and waiting to emerge. So these are teenage bugs that are getting ready to sing in your trees and mate and make more cicadas. And so do the, the next ones are 17 years later again? Is that, yep. is that the role of them? <laughs> That's right. So it's these prime numbers. So there's the 13 year ones and the 17 year ones. I, there's a lot of research on if they are distinct species or if they could possibly mate together. There's some evidence it sounds like that sometimes the 17 year ones turn into 13 year broods that they can split and that it's happened the other way as well. 
we have stragglers sometimes. So a 13 year cicada that comes out four years later than it was supposed to is now sort of a 17 year cicada. Uh, there's a lot of weirdness to this. And it's a very difficult thing to study for a scientist because you could potentially only get like two shots at it in your whole career uh, unless you're willing to travel the entire nation. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned they were by trees. So do they hurt the trees? Damage that's a, anything? That's a good question. And it's something that I know a lot of the extension agents are getting asked right now is what is this going to do to our trees? So when they're nymphs and below ground, they're, they're sucking sap out of the tree roots. It's very minimal impact on those trees. Uh, you would hardly ever notice that there's anything going on with that. When they emerge in mass, these billions of cicadas are coming out. They are mating and the female is going to lay her eggs after the mating has occurred. She has an ovipositor. It's kind of this sword-like object that comes off of the tail tip of her abdomen. And she'll use that to slice into the tree and to insert her eggs into that plant. On a big mature tree, they do like oaks, they like elms and ashes. And on a big stately tree, one that's been around for a while, you're not really gonna see any impact. You'll see some flagging where those twigs that she has used may bend over and snap. And you'll see that scattered throughout the plant, but it'll grow out of it, it'll be okay. When we're talking about a smaller, newly transplanted tree, that's obviously something of a concern. They also like fruit trees. We have seen them impact orchards before. And so, yes, there is the potential that trees could be harmed, particularly a new one in your landscape. So we do try to advertise to folks that if you put netting around the plant, the netting should have holes that are smaller than half an inch. So you don't want to go out and just buy general use bird netting, which may be a little bit bigger than that. You want to get a little smaller diameter there and wrap that around the tree and leave it up for about six to eight weeks. You have to monitor and see when the cicadas start to disappear. But if you take it off too early, they're going to be able to get on there and lay their eggs. But that is a good force field to help protect that plant. Wow. So that's really kind of only practical in smaller trees, though. I mean, can't exactly. Have... Yeah. Yeah. You can't go out and put a net on your big trees. There, for fruit growers, we do talk sometimes about insecticides. Uh, you could talk about pyrethroids and things like that, which will provide some residue. But for just an average citizen, somebody that's got a tree in their yard that they're concerned about, the netting is a better option, I would argue, just because otherwise you're going to be applying insecticides probably two to three times over the course of this emergence. And they're usually pretty broad spectrum. You're going to be harming a lot more than just the cicadas. So it's better to use the netting and try and live and let live and just tell them, hey, go lay your eggs somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you. What about woodlands, though? People that have multiple acres. So if you've got a lot of trees and they're, they're kind of big and they're out there, uh, if, if you can, you can kind of get through it and it'll be OK. It's very rare, I would say, that we're going to see a tree get killed by these insects. It's not usually that big of a problem. But if you've got lots of trees like that, I know the netting seems a little impractical, but it is, we talk to tree nurseries about this as well. Uh, I know that I work with a lot of nursery and landscape folks, and they're the, they're the ones that are probably going to be buying up a lot of the netting here soon. So where, where's the range of these then? Where's that? Okay. So I've got some pictures I can share here. I'll share my screen. Here's a map showing from the, so what we're going to experience this year is called Brood X or Brood 10. And it's kind of an interesting way that we separate these things out over the over the entire nation. There have been some entomologists over the years. Uh, C.L. Marlat is the one that kind of formalized this process and came up with the multiple broods. Um, they were named by C.V. Riley and Benjamin Watson before him. But this is brood X. This is in 1919. You can see how it was spread across. This is called the Great Eastern Brood. And I think you get a good indication of why it has that name. It does go from the East Coast over into Indiana and Illinois. Kentucky was a state that had it spread across it in the past. It's a little less nowadays. This is the most up-to-date information that I can find from the University of Connecticut. They have a researcher there that's really focused on these periodical cicadas. And so this is information from 2004, the last time that Brood X emerged here in the state of Kentucky. So if you look here, you can see where they located it, where they got reports of it, and they have kept track of these kinds of things. The list of counties that should see cicada emergences this year, I'll try and go over it quickly, but Boone, Breckenridge, Bullitt, Carroll, Davies County, Gallatin, Grayson, Henry, Jefferson, LaRue, McLean, Muhlenberg, Nelson, Ohio, Oldham, and Trimble. 
So what you should notice there is that these are a lot of river corridor counties and a few others that infiltrate the state, but that's where we're going to see this happen mostly is in these wooded areas near the water. Jonathan, I was going to say I had a chance to be up in Henry County, I guess the last emergence of these, and we were doing a field day up there in the woods, and it was so loud you couldn't even hear the people talking, and we had microphones. It was amazing just the, the volume that they can generate. It, it is very loud. It's often compared to a chainsaw on an individual basis. I was looking at, there's a website called Cicada Mania, which is where a lot of the researchers that look at these insects will post information. And some of the stuff that they've been sharing on there is that it's, it gets up to almost 107 decibels, I think. Yeah. Uh, they had a sound. For a cicada? Measuring. Yeah, for a cicada. Or, wow. or for a chorus, I should say. For a chorus, yeah. okay. Uh, that's actually another interesting thing to talk about. I was hoping I could play some of the sounds. That'd be great. Uh, here today. Uh, so <laughs> Give everybody a preview of what they may yeah, hear. Yeah, soon. Yeah. It's beautiful. And I hope you all have your earbuds in. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll show. So first I want to show you just how they make the noise. Um, so this is a male cicada. They're the ones that actually generate the noise. So this should be moving, hopefully. If you see that white kind of membranous looking thing on the side of the cicada, this is called a timbre. And it's an organ on the insect that they can flex. If you look at it there, it's like a drum head mm -hmm. and you might see it vibrate. There should be a shadow that kind of yeah, appears there. Yeah. It. Yeah. So in this GIF, hopefully that, that comes through. But he, the male is the only one that does this in these cicadas and he will flex this timbre. He's mostly hollow on the inside. And so the sound that is generated by this kind of reverberates in him and then he can release the sound and uh, have it come out as something to either recruit other male cicadas to the tree that he's in or to try and talk to the female cicadas that are nearby. So they do have, they have a call where they're like, hey, fellas, let's make a barbershop quartet, come over to my tree. <laughs> and then they'll show up and then they'll sing a chorus and that chorus will recruit females to the tree. And then following that, there'll be a courtship song between a male and a female. And if she accepts his courtship, she flicks her wings. That's the only sound that she really makes. So here is a magic cicada, a periodical cicada chorus from New Jersey. So they may have an accent, don't hold it against them. <laughs> Very loud. If you're in any of those counties I mentioned before, you'll hear that a lot this summer. They also will make a distress call, which is where you pick them up and they may sound very angry. Um, here's a courtship call. Very romantic, right? I mean, Almost sounds look. like our weather warning <laughs> sirens. And I was going to say, or that may be where people get, hey, we have aliens somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, just imagine that with candlelight, some Marvin Gaye in the background or something. I mean, it's a very romantic sound. Yeah. Uh, that's what they use to try and communicate with one another to kind of facilitate this mating. It's the thing that people complain about a lot with these insects is that they're so noisy. You know, Jonathan, I've heard or seen some recipes, too, about people trying to consume and eat these cicadas. Now, I don't know that we could eat enough of them to make an impact, but... If there are that any... many of them, then maybe. There's yeah. so many of them, yeah. So that's actually one of the things that we also get asked questions about is why are there so many? And so this is a thing that we call predator satiation. The first ones that emerge, they're usually the first out are the first eaten. And the things that eat them are turkeys. I heard Matt Springer talk, talking the other day about copperheads love to eat these. Uh, that's fascinating to me. I know that squirrels, basically anything with a mouth that has a meat uh, aspect to its diet, they will eat these cicadas. And so they, they get their glut of them and then they don't want them anymore. It's like if you just kept eating tacos, 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 tacos all the time, you get sick of tacos. And so all the cicadas that come out after those early ones, they get to mate. And it's kind of a way of escaping these predators. Uh -huh. So we are a, one of the predators of cicadas. There are a lot of traditional recipes. You can look at native culture and they talk about uh, cooking these and trying to find them. You can also look and see modern chefs that have tried to do stuff with them. They are supposed to have sort of a nutty flavor. Uh, I haven't eaten a periodical cicada myself. I've eaten many bugs, but I haven't had the opportunity to eat these. But usually they're skewered and put over an open flame and cooked like that. If you have a shellfish allergy, please don't eat them. There is the possibility that you could be allergic to cicadas. And there is often a disclaimer when we see people talk about this, that 
They have been below ground for 17 years. It's possible they could have been exposed to contaminants that have entered the soil. So eat in moderation, just like we talk about with alcohol and everything. You don't want too many cicadas all at once. Yeah, you, but you want to still have an appetite later for them. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. So uh, what's the time frame for these? This is going to happen in May and June here this year. And it'll be, there'll be, each individual cicada has about, a, about four or five weeks above ground. Uh, they don't get, they live for 17 years as kids and then they don't last for very long as adults but it will be spread out over sort of a six to eight week period. We have a comment that said in 1970 in Western, Western Maryland, the sound of them drove out black bears into backyards and towns. Holy cow. Black bear, had, black bear had to be shot one night on the steps of city hall in Cumberland, Maryland. Well, I hope that that doesn't happen around yeah. here or happen. Yeah, no. uh, I know that bears, bears will eat them sometimes, but hopefully, yeah, they're, they're not driven by the noise into cities and towns. I guess if there were so many, because that is, that is quite loud, is that it could be a, a shock to our wildlife out there. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, man. That, yes. That's some interesting stuff, Jonathan. I'm sure you're going to be getting lots of calls. And, um, we're as we're the, very excited. Uh, I am excited, and I like talking about it. I like sharing the noise with everybody and, and letting them know. Uh, I hope that if you are listening, that you take the opportunity to go see this. It is a very unique and American experience. This doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. And here in Kentucky, you can go to Big Bone Lick State Park and check it out. You can be socially distanced and wear your masks and, and do some responsible things like that while we're still in pandemic season. But Big Bone Lick, Louisville, Covington, Georgetown, uh, I think what was some of the Newport, there's there's a list on Cicada Mania of some of the hot spots where you can go out and experience this. And maybe try a few if you if you have a, a camper grill with you or something. So do some places actually hold cicada festivals? I don't know what will happen oh. this time around, uh, just because yeah. of all the COVID-19 and everything. But yes, generally speaking, it when is. this occurs, there there are lots of festivals. Uh, I know I previously worked in Omaha, Nebraska, and we were on the very edge of an emergence in 2015, and they had a little get together, and it was like a, a cicada cook-off, <laughs> and there was a brewery there that was trying to figure out how to brew a cicada beer, and I don't know <laughs> if they ever quite nailed it, but um, I do know that there were lots of people that were interested. <laughs> Jonathan, that's some great stuff. Thank you so much for being thanks, with us and sharing that. Um, yeah, and we'll have you back again real soon. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Maybe in May or June to tell yeah. again. <laughs> I'll have my costume done by then. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. Thanks thanks so hey, thanks for all you do, Dr. Larson. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good one. Oh. Hey, Renee, those were some really interesting topics today. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. You never know what we're going to end up talking about on From the Woods today. <laughs> no, no, we certainly appreciate y'all being with us each week. And just as a general reminder, all of our shows are recorded and available on fromthewoodstoday.com. Um, you can check them out there. We also have them posted on our YouTube page. Individual segments are posted as well. Um, so if you've missed any shows, please um, catch up with them. Definitely. And you know, um, every week we have some kind of new show topic. And if you have any ideas for show topics, there is a little link on our fromthewoodstoday.com page where you can submit show ideas. And I know some of the ideas have popped in and we've actually run them from viewers out there. So um, make sure that uh, you give us any kind of feedback that you'd like. And um, I guess until then, Billy, we'll just see them next week at 11 o'clock. All right. Everybody be safe and we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye. Bye.